Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we are recording Fundamentals of Clinical Pharmacology, and this is part three. The next step in pharmacokinetics is biotransformation, which is basically metabolism, and metabolism mostly happens in the liver. One of the main goals of metabolism is to make drugs hydrophilic so they can be excreted in the urine. And this is done by a couple different processes. Phase one chemical reactions that occur in the liver usually involve some sort of transformation by means of the cytochrome P450 superfamily of enzymes. Different reactions include oxidation, reduction, hydrolysis, all with the goal of making the chemical more hydrophilic so it can be excreted in the urine. This is a good place for drug reactions to occur. Because if one drug upregulates or downregulates the activity of a specific cytochrome P450 enzyme subfamily, that can have effect on the metabolism of other drugs. So, for example, the 3A4 and 3A5 subfamilies are responsible for metabolism of a lot of anesthetic drugs like opioids, benzodiazepines, and local anesthetics. So, if a patient is taking something that um, occupies or downregulates the effectiveness of this enzyme, then you may see other drugs have a prolonged duration of action or behave like they're more potent because they're not being metabolized in their normal way. Phase two reactions usually involve conjugation or adding something on to the metabolite from the phase one reaction. And we can add lots of different substances like glucuronate or acetate or glutathione. These are also hydrophilic uh, molecular groups, which are polar. And so they, again, work towards the final goal of making drugs more and more hydrophilic so they can be excreted in the urine. The phase two reactions are usually not carried out by the cytochrome P450 enzyme family. Just one note, our Pediatric population, particularly the neonates, have a very diminished phase 1 and phase 2 activity, which is one of the reasons why drugs may be more active in those patients. Now we're going to speak about hepatic metabolism in some detail. Hepatic drug clearance is simply the volume of blood that the liver could cleanse of drug per unit time. This is just using our definition of the word clearance and applying it specifically to clearance as performed by the liver. And hepatic drug clearance is simply uh, the product of the hepatic blood flow and the extraction ratio. And let's define these two terms. So hepatic blood flow is pretty easy. As your cardiac output increases, you send more blood per unit time to the liver. And obviously, if you don't send blood to the liver, you can't metabolize drugs in the liver. So, at least to some degree, increased hepatic blood flow ought to increase metabolism. However, there are other factors. For example, the hepatic extraction ratio, which describes how much of a drug is the liver able to remove from the blood as the drug, as the blood passes through the liver. And some drugs have a very high extraction ratio, which means the liver does a very efficient job of taking drug out of the blood as it passes through the liver and metabolizing it. And other drugs have a very low hepatic extraction ratio, which means that the drug is not very efficiently metabolized as the bloodstream passes through the liver. For example, drugs with a high extraction ratio might be etomidate or propofol. And we actually call these flow limited because the clearance of drug is proportional to blood flow. And so we can look at our graphs over here to get an understanding of this. Here's a drug with a very high extraction ratio. Almost 100% of the drug can be extracted from the blood as it passes through the liver. And so we see as blood flow increases, that's all the liver needs. Send it more blood and it will metabolize more drug because it's taking 100% of the drug out of the blood with each pass. So we call this flow limited. It's only limited by the flow. And the clearance is really proportional to blood flow. And this is going to be true unless the liver is very, very sick. Other drugs 
have a low hepatic extraction ratio. Drugs like thiopental or diazepam, these are drugs which would be lower down on this graph. And these drugs are not really affected very significantly by hepatic blood flow because the liver is already not doing a very good job of extracting drug from the blood as it passes through the liver. And so increasing blood flow is really not the rate limiting step. The rate limiting step is more the ability of the liver to extract. Now if we think of the liver differently, instead of thinking about changing blood flow, let's think about a healthy liver versus a sick liver. So some people have a liver that is working very well. And so then we can compare that situation with people whose livers are working super well. They have enzyme induction, which means, for example, a person who drinks alcohol so often and so regularly that they've induced the enzymes. Their liver is more and more fit to metabolize alcohol quickly. Compared with, on the other side of this axis, someone who has liver disease or enzyme inhibition. Their liver is working poorly compared to someone with a good liver. So now, how does liver function affect clearance? Well, in our patient, sorry, in our drug that has a high extraction ratio, so let's think about this. The liver is extracting drug very well. And as we decrease liver function, it still extracts drug very well until finally it gets to the point where it's unable to extract any drug because the liver has so little met metabolic activity. Other drugs, drugs with a low extraction ratio, the liver is already doing a less than 100% job of extracting drug from the bloodstream as it passes through the liver. So in these patients, if I could give the liver a little bit more activity, I should see a proportional increase in metabolic activity. I should see an increase in clearance. And if I damage the liver, if I inhibit enzymes or add liver disease, these patients should have a proportional decrease in hepatic clearance. So we see that drugs with a high extraction ratio are mostly flow limited. These are drugs that are metabolized primarily in proportion to their hepatic blood flow. Drugs with a low extraction ratio are capacity limited, which means that hepatic blood flow doesn't have very much effect but changing the metabolic activity of the liver will have a big effect on the hepatic clearance. These are graphs that you need to sit and think about for a few minutes. This isn't something you can learn the first time you look at this slide. There are lists of how different anesthetic drugs fall into the categorization of low, intermediate, or high extraction ratios. This isn't something you would memorize for an exam. But you should be familiar with the idea that some drugs fall into different columns here. So propofol is a, a high extraction ratio drug. And so it's really going to be flow limited. The more cardiac output there is, the faster propofol will be metabolized. Compared with something like rocuronium over here, where we really don't expect rocuronium's metabolism to be affected very much as a function of cardiac output, but we do expect it to be affected when the metabolic function of the liver changes. So in a patient who has induced enzymes or a patient who has liver disease. Now we've talked about the liver, which is important. We need to move on to the next step in metabolism, which is the kidney. Because drugs are cleared out through the kidney. Now the kidney operates very differently from the liver. In the liver, we spoke a lot about hepatic blood flow. And we saw that there are some drugs where if I increase hepatic blood flow, I can get more hepatic clearance. This is not the case in the kidneys. The kidneys have a phenomenon called autoregulation. This is something you may learn about in neurophysiology, but it applies in the kidney as well. And the idea is, regardless of cardiac output, regardless of whether your blood pressure is very low or very high, autoregulation means that renal blood flow will remain the same. The arteries that go to the kidneys will dilate and contract in order to make sure the kidneys always get the same blood flow, regardless of cardiac output, except if it's extremely, extremely high or low. 
So that's point number one. Now, renal clearance, the ability of the kidney to clear a certain amount of drug out of a volume of blood in a given amount of time. So renal clearance is actually much smaller than renal blood flow, which means to say that I can deliver a certain amount of blood to the kidney, but only a very small fraction of it is capable of being cleared by the kidneys. This is probably because of all the protein binding, and the kidneys can't clear out drugs when they're bound to protein. So it seems like an inefficient system. How do I get the kidneys to do a better job of clearing drug out from all of this blood that's being delivered to the kidneys? Well, the answer is we have something called transporters. The renal tubules have active transporters that can latch on to molecules and actively transport them into the nephron, into the renal tubule. And at that point, we can see renal clearance approaching a level of renal blood flow. Now patients who have impaired renal function may need you to change the dosing of drugs in order to account for the fact that their kidneys work more slowly. If you give them regular doses, you may see accumulation of both parent compounds and metabolites, and you need to be aware that there are drugs out there that have a very significant amount of renal excretion. And this list is some of the drugs that we commonly think twice before we dose them in the regular dose, especially in patients who have renal disease. You can see a lot of common drugs here, including cephalosporin antibiotics, neostigmine, lots of other antibiotics, and some neuromuscular blocking drugs as well. We'll stop here. This has been a more detailed and complicated section. So if you have questions, please make note of them and ask in class so we can go over them again and address your misconceptions or your uncertainties. And we'll catch you again in the next video coming up soon.